Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. We begin tonight with a big story in the world of tech that has direct implications for you. The U.S. government has sued Apple. The company has lost $100 billion in value and the battle has just begun. We'll tell you all about it. Prime Minister Modi of India is in Bhutan just four days after the Bhutanese Prime Minister was in India. Why did he have to go in the middle of an election? What's cooking against China? We'll discuss that. Is India coming up with its own democracy index? If not, it should. It's the best way to counter flawed ratings from the West. Does France want to send troops to Ukraine? What is Emmanuel Macron's strategy? Why Rishi Sunak faces the risk of ouster in the UK? How a genetically edited pig kidney has been transplanted into a human? It's the first such operation. Why Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has been arrested and how it will impact the election? Why tensions between Venezuela and Guyana have intensified? How we've pumped out so much water, we've changed the Earth's spin. And what is biohacking? Why Wall Street giants and tech bosses are taking drugs to boost productivity. All this and more coming up. The headlines first. At least 23 soldiers killed in Niger. The soldiers were ambushed during a raid in western Niger. The junta says more than 100 terrorists attacked the army unit with homemade bombs and suicide vehicles. Around 30 terrorists were also killed in this gun battle. Russia and China veto the US draft resolution on Gaza ceasefire at the United Nations. Moscow accuses Washington of hypocrisy, saying the draft is a gimmick, keeping in mind the US elections. Until now, Washington, Israel's main ally, had vetoed all ceasefire calls. More than two years after it invaded Ukraine, Russia admits it's in a state of war. Initially, the Kremlin called it a special military operation. The admission comes as Moscow steps up attacks on Kiev. Last night, Russia hit Ukraine with nearly 90 missiles and more than 60 Iranian kamikaze drones. The Indian rupee hits an all-time low against the US dollar. It's the sharpest weekly fall in seven months. The slide was due to a high demand for the dollar from importers and a drop in offshore Chinese yuan. North Korea's World Cup qualifier against Japan is called off. Earlier officials had said the match would be moved to a neutral venue after Pyongyang decided against hosting it next week. North Korea gave no reason for cancelling the match. And a fresh blow to the 2026 Commonwealth Games. Malaysia says no to hosting the Games, citing cost as the main reason. Last year, the Australian state of Victoria had done the same. Do you use an iPhone? If you do, you know about the Apple ecosystem. It traps you. You buy one Apple product and you have to keep buying Apple. Devices, services, software, everything Apple. If you want an app, you have to go to the Apple App Store. You cannot buy Android. If you want to iMessage someone, they must have an Apple phone. iMessage works only on iPhones. Same with accessories. You want a smartwatch or earphone or charger. You'd be inclined to buy Apple because non-Apple accessories do not work very well with the iPhone. It's like a relationship you cannot exit. Until recently, it applied to the charger too. You couldn't charge your iPhone without Apple's lightning cable. Thankfully, that has changed. Not because Apple had a change of heart, but because the law mandated it. And now lawmakers are going after the rest of the Apple ecosystem. Leading the way is the US government. It has sued Apple. And this is a landmark lawsuit. If the US government wins, it could reshape the most powerful tech company of our times. It's already making investors jittery. Soon after the case was filed, Apple stock took a nose dive. It fell by almost 4%, which is a loss of over $100 billion. Apple lost $100 billion in value. It's not really a big deal for them. This company is worth more than $2 trillion, so they can take a $100 billion drop. But the lawsuit poses a larger problem. It puts a spotlight on the company's core business model, the whole philosophy of the Apple ecosystem. It's now under the scanner. The list of issues that I just shared with you, they form the basis for this lawsuit. 
The U.S. government feels that Apple wants to keep its customers locked in and its rivals locked out. And the language of the lawsuit is damaging. It argues that the Apple model leaves customers with fewer choices, it imposes high fees and prices on them, and it limits competition and innovation. Listen to the U.S. Attorney General. He announced the lawsuit yesterday. Apple charges as much as nearly $1,600 for an iPhone. But as our complaint alleges, Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. Apple has consolidated its monopoly power not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. You heard him. Apple became a monopoly by making products from others worse. It's a big charge and it doesn't end there. This lawsuit goes beyond the consumers. It also talks about the woes of the developers. These are people who make apps for Apple, or the companies that make apps for Apple. Apple has complete control over which apps can run on its platform. It does not allow what's commonly called sideloading. That's the practice of using apps from third-party sources by circumventing the official app store. Apple does not allow it. And this power allows Apple to dictate which apps end up on your phones and tablets. So Apple has a lot of leverage here. According to the lawsuit, when a user buys something from the App Store, when you buy something from the App Store, Apple can take away as much as 30% of the revenue. Say you pay $10, $10, Apple can take as much as $3 from that. This is what it takes from the developers. And the developers are powerless because Apple controls the App Store. So the developers will have to pay whatever fee Apple demands. The US government wants to dismantle this monopoly. And what is Apple's response? The company plans to fight back. Apple says it will, quote unquote, vigorously fight this lawsuit. So expect a showdown in courts. Apple is among the world's most valuable companies. Of course, it has the capacity and the means to fight back. It can mount a legal challenge. It can put up a strong defense. But look at who they're up against. It's not just the US government. Around the world, Apple's business model and practices are being scrutinized. The European Union is also breathing down their neck. Last year, the EU forced Apple to dump the lightning cable and switch to a more common platform for its phone, the USB Type-C. Recently, the EU struck Apple again. It passed a Digital Markets Act. It has forced companies like Apple to allow side loading of apps on iPhones. And the US is trying to do the same through this lawsuit. Apple has been facing legal trouble here in India too. Since 2021, India's competition watchdog has been probing Apple. It is called the Competition Commission of India or CCI. Some Indian startups had complained against Apple. On the same charges, Apple abuses its market dominance, the commission rates are high, and third-party distribution is restricted. Plus, India has been mulling a new law, something along the lines of the EU's Digital Markets Act. It's called the Digital Competition Bill. Its provisions are similar to the European law. The bill may push Apple to open up its walled garden. Reports say Apple is opposed to this bill. But you see the pattern. Across the world, Apple is under scrutiny. It will put up a strong resistance, yes, but it won't be able to walk away without taking a few hits. Now let's turn our attention to Bhutan, India's northeastern neighbor, a country of less than a million people and often called the last Shangri-La. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in Bhutan. He arrived there this morning amid great fanfare. Bhutan knows how to throw a grand welcome. And they also awarded Modi their highest civilian honor, the Order of the Druk Gyalpo. Bhutan ki is mahan bhoomi par 
मैं सभी भारतवासियों की ओर से यह सम्मान नम्रता से स्वीकार करता हूं और इस सम्मान के लिए आपका और भूटान की जनता का हृदय से कोटि कोटि धन्यवाद करता हूं It's a great privilege, and it shows the importance that Bhutan places on its ties with India, and the bond extends both ways. Modi's visit comes on the eve of Indian elections. The dates have already been announced, and it's a first for a sitting prime minister really to focus on diplomacy in the middle of an election. And that is not the only unusual part. This visit comes after Bhutan's prime minister was just in India. Prime Minister. Sharing Tobge was in New Delhi this week. It was his first foreign visit after being elected in January. He was in India for five days. He left on Monday. So, if talks took place so recently, it seems strange that Modi has gone to Bhutan now, unless there's something bigger at play. We we'll, we have much to talk about. I will have. I will need your support as we move forward. Bhutan's prime minister has called for support and India is rushing to deliver. India's prime minister himself is answering that call and you can see how thrilled Bhutan is. There was the award and Bhutan's prime minister even referred to Modi as his elder brother. Why do you suppose that is? Why the call for support? How can India be of help to Bhutan right now? Well, there are two ways, economically and militarily. We'll start with the economy. Bhutan is facing an economic crisis. Youth unemployment was at 29% in January. Growth has been stagnant at around 1.7% over the last five years. And the people want progress. That's why they voted to bring back Prime Minister Tobge. He's previously served as Prime Minister between 2013 and 2018, and he has a proven track record. This time around, he has a challenging mandate, and he's been tasked to fulfill an ambitious plan. Bhutan, you see, is a constitutional monarchy. They have a king, King Jigme Khesar Namagyal Wangchuk. In December, the king unveiled a new project. He wants to transform the southern town of Gelefu, turn it into a mindfulness city. Now look at the location. Gelefu is right at the border, across from the Indian state of Assam, which means India can play a crucial role in getting this mindfulness city going. Bhutan wants to turn the town into a special economic zone. They want to upgrade the Gelefu airport and, of course, bring in investments and jobs. India could be of help in all of this. Build the airport, upgrade road and rail connectivity and help direct investments Bhutan's way. Well, that's the economic aspect. Now for the military part, Bhutan is in a tough spot. Unfortunately, it also borders China. And like all of China's other neighbors, it faces aggression. China claims parts of Bhutan's territory. The usual bogus claims, some Ming emperor's uncle's favorite goat may have grazed there, so China now wants Bhutan's land, specifically these four areas. Indians will know the western one. That's where Doklam is located. India and China had a tense border standoff there in 2017. China was trying to encroach on Doklam. India sent troops to defend Bhutan and forced China to back off. But Beijing has not given up on Doklam. They've been trying other ways to get the land. They recently made Bhutan an offer. China said it would relinquish claims in northern Bhutan. In exchange, they wanted Doklam. But so far, Bhutan has not agreed. China has been applying pressure. They're building illegal settlements in northern Bhutan. But Thimpu has not buckled. So now, with the pro-India Prime Minister Tobge in charge, Bhutan may be working on a way to counter China, and India's Prime Minister Modi may be willing to help. If there is a military deal, do not expect to get all the details. After all, why would these countries make something like that public? But even announcing a military pact will be important. It will send a stern message to Beijing and assure Thimpu of India's eternal friendship. That's smart diplomacy, we say, and it justifies the visit in the middle of a very busy election schedule. What do you do when a system does not work? A, you try to fix it, or B, you can build your own. India has chosen option B, it seems. It has long criticized Western indices and surveys on democracy, but now 
patience has run out. So reports say India is publishing its own, a homegrown democracy index. An Indian think tank is making it. Reports say it could be published in the next few weeks, maybe even before the general election. Now, we don't know what the methodology will be or what indicators will be used or which countries will be ranked, but we will say this. Such a move was necessary. You cannot let Western yardsticks measure the world. If you do, the problem is obvious. The West will look good, the rest will not. And this is a big problem. A lot of people factor these reports into big decisions, like investors looking at a stock market bet, or companies looking to open factories, or even tourists looking to travel. So these rankings are like report cards for countries. A good one will give you tangible benefits, a bad one will keep investors away. So it's important to look at these rankings closely, to see how fair or unfair they are. Let's look at three such recent indices. The first is the Liberal Democracy Index. It was published by Sweden's VDEM Institute. And where does India rank? At 104. Now listen to this carefully. India's rank is 104. Guess who is just above India? Niger. Let me repeat that for you. Niger ranks above India in the VDEM Index on Liberal Democracies. To put that in context, Niger is currently ruled by a military junta. Their president is under house arrest since July 2023. Yet Niger ranks above India. So does Kuwait. Last month, Kuwait dissolved its parliament. Guess why? Because some lawmaker insulted the emir. It's constitutionally illegal to criticize the emir. So the entire parliament was dissolved. That country ranks above India. I guess when you have oil, democracy has a different definition. The next index is unhappiness. India ranks 126th on that list. Look at all the countries above it. Pakistan is at 108. This is a country where inflation is higher than the average age, where terrorists attack every day, where generals rig elections, and where the IMF decides the budget. I guess that's what Pakistanis are happy about, being broke and unsafe. Also above India is Myanmar, a country that has been at civil war for seven decades. Ukraine is ranked 105. Palestine ranked 103. Iran is ranked 100. We are honestly lost for words here. Ukraine is being invaded. Palestine does not have statehood and Iran is ruled by a supreme leader. Yet people there are happier than Indians. Finally, we have press freedom. This one is published by the RSF, Reporters Without Borders. India is ranked 161 on this list of 180 countries. Press freedom, 161. Afghanistan is at 152. That's Taliban's Afghanistan. Let me show you what press freedom looks like there. That's press freedom for you. That's not all. Pakistan ranks above India. So do the UAE, Brunei, Somalia and Uganda. You don't have to be an expert to know that this is wrong. These rankings cannot possibly be true. But why does it keep happening? One problem is the sample size. It's often too small. Consider the World Happiness Index. They sample just 1,000 people every year. For a country like India, that's nothing. 1,000 out of 1.4 billion people. And it's not just about the size. It's also the nature of the population. You have regional differences. You have religious differences. You have socioeconomic differences. So 1,000 is too small. It will never give you the true picture. Same with press freedom. The survey takes 10 responses from each country. So if the methodology is not working, why are these surveys still being published? Because it suits the Western agenda. We looked at the top 10 countries on all three lists. Four of them are the same. They figure in all three indices. Three others feature in at least two lists. So it's basically the same countries leading all these reports, the same Western countries. So why would they stop publishing it? Which is why having a homegrown index is not a bad idea. It's not about one upping the other side. It's about offering a different system, a different perspective. Maybe for a change, we can factor in the gun deaths in America, or the hijab bans in Europe, or the brutal migration laws, or the restrictions on abortion. Then it would be a fair survey.
Let's turn to France now. There's a lot of speculation about their role in Ukraine and not without reason. Top French officials are hinting at something radical, a possible intervention in Ukraine. I'm talking about putting soldiers on the ground, French soldiers. The first hint was dropped by Emmanuel Macron. He refused to rule out deployments in Ukraine. There is no consensus today to send ground troops in an official, endorsed and sanctioned manner. But in dynamic terms, nothing should be ruled out. We will do whatever it takes to ensure that Russia cannot win this war. But Macron's allies are not eager. The US has ruled out sending soldiers. So have Germany, Britain and Italy. Yet France is not backing down. Now the army chief has spoken out. The French army chief, he says, French support could go beyond military supplies. What does that mean? Logic says deployments. Another top general has hinted at the same. He says France can call up 20,000 soldiers in one month. He also said France can lead a coalition of 60,000 NATO soldiers. It seems Macron was not joking around. His army is backing up what he said. You see, sending soldiers can mean a lot of things. It doesn't have to be combat troops. It can be a training role or an advisory role or a security role. For that, there is some support. In fact, some NATO soldiers are already in Ukraine. They're helping and training Ukrainian troops. But that's a very small deployment. Some reports say just 97 NATO soldiers. Macron is hinting at a larger deployment. The question is why? What is he hoping to achieve? Well, grand plans are not new territory for Emmanuel Macron. He's always had big ambitions, whether in Europe or the Indo-Pacific or in NATO. So Macron is not a stranger to such policies. But what is the strategic angle here? Well, we can think of two. Number one, to deter Russia. We know that Ukraine's military aid is drying up. Around $60 billion is stuck in the US Congress, plus Russia is on the attack. They're making rapid battlefield gains. So maybe Macron is throwing a spanner into the Russian war machine. He's giving Putin something, something to think about. We have a goal. Russia cannot and must not win this war. This is the continuity of France's position. We are at your side because we are at the side of peace and there is no peace for Ukraine and for Europe that would require a capitulation of the Ukrainians because that would be a renunciation of our security. In the past, on several occasions, when there have been conflicts, this same choice has been made. Indications are Moscow has taken the bait. Russia's spy chief has made a big claim. He says France is preparing to send 2,000 soldiers to Ukraine. So that could be one goal that Macron is chasing, deterring Russia. Number two, to cement French leadership. Macron is a senior player in Europe now. He's always had grand plans for the bloc, like a European army or a common foreign policy. So this could be an extension. A bold Macron standing up for Ukraine. But will this actually happen? Could we see NATO soldiers inside Ukraine? As of now, it's unlikely. Most NATO members will look for signals from the US, and the US has elections this year. If Joe Biden deploys soldiers abroad, he could face backlash, which is why Washington is staying away. President Biden has been crystal clear since the beginning of this conflict. There'll be no US troops on the ground in a combat role there uh, in Ukraine. There's also a double standard here. Macron talks about sending soldiers to Ukraine, which is a radical and dangerous move. But why doesn't he look at the safer option? I'm talking about military aid. Just look at the top donors to Ukraine. The US occupies the top spot. They've given some $46 billion. Germany has given almost $20 billion and the UK around $10 billion. How much military aid has France given? Just $700 million. Now, Macron's government has disputed this number. They say the actual figure is 2.8 billion. Even then, it's quite low. So Macron's words and actions do not quite match. Yes, NATO soldiers in Ukraine would deter Russia, but it would also require a lot of political will, something that, that NATO does not have. Macron would be better served looking at other options, like mobilizing the European defense industry or convincing Germany to send long-range weapons. These are more achievable options. But then again, there's no immortality in achievable goals.
Our next story is from across the channel from the UK. The weekly opinion polls came out yesterday and they had bad news for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Sunak is from Britain's Conservative Party, also known as the Tories. This party has been in power since 2010 and now their popularity has hit its lowest level. This week's survey put their approval rating at 19%. This is the second time it has fallen so low, 19%. You know the last time this happened? It was back in September 2022 under former Prime Minister Liz Truss, the one who couldn't outlast a head of lettuce. She is Sunak's predecessor and the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. She was Prime Minister for only 49 days and a big reason was her massive unpopularity. Now Rishi Sunak has gone ahead and matched her record. He's also fallen below the 20% threshold. Does this mean his days as Prime Minister are numbered? If you believe the tabloids, then a coup is apparently in the works. Bring out your letters. Because the Tories are apparently planning to throw Sunak under the bus and replace him with a relatively fresh face. Possibly Penny Mordaunt. She leads the Tories in the lower house of parliament and she's tried to become Prime Minister twice already. She lost to both trusts and then Sunak, back in 2022. Now she may be trying her luck again, but instead of focusing on Mordaunt, let's look at the Tories and Sunak, and how we arrived at this situation. The Tories are desperately trying to hold on to power. They're extremely unpopular, a whole 25% behind their chief rivals, the UK Labour Party. Britain will hold elections soon, no later than next January, but in all likelihood way before that. So the, so the Tories do not have much time to win back support, which is why they may be thinking about ousting Rishi Sunak. So he becomes their fall guy. There's a grand show of remorse, proclamations of a change in direction, the usual spiel. And this is an old Tory tactic. It's the same way they got rid of Liz Truss, a rebellion followed by an internal vote. Before her, there was Boris Johnson, before Johnson, Theresa May, and before that, the Tory who started this carousel, David Cameron. The Tories have had five prime ministers in less than 15 years, and now they're apparently thinking about PM number six. But no matter how many times they change the face, the party keeps losing support. So maybe it's time they get some new ideas or accept their upcoming defeat and let Rishi Sunak finish his term with as little fuss as possible. Because for Sunak, that's the best case scenario. He's deeply unpopular, reaching Liz Trust levels, despite slowly chugging along with his plans. Inflation is down in the UK. It hit 3.4% last month, the lowest level in two and a half years. But the Bank of England is not convinced. It hasn't reduced interest rates, meaning it doesn't believe that Rishi Sunak has succeeded yet. Sunak has also tried solving illegal migration with a controversial Rwanda bill. The bill passed the lower chamber of parliament, but the British House of Lords refuses to move it along. So in his desperation, Prime Minister Sunak has come up with a new Rwanda scheme. He now wants to pay asylum seekers to go to Rwanda. He's reportedly offering £3,000 per refugee. He wants to pay them to leave. You can imagine how a conservative supporter base reacted to that. So it makes sense that Sunak's popularity keeps diminishing. It isn't just one poll saying this. Every poll is painting a grim picture for Rishi Sunak. Earlier this month, the public was especially harsh. They called him weak and useless. The Labour Party is loving this. They keep goading Sunak, calling him a coward for not holding elections immediately. It shows their confidence in Sunak's dire situation. For him, the best case scenario is that he remains Prime Minister till early next year. Worst case, today's lettuce lasts longer. But either way, Rishi Sunak and the Tories have capitulated and no political manoeuvres are likely to turn things around. Our next story is a first in the medical world. A pig kidney was transplanted in a human. It was given to a patient who had end-stage renal disease. The kidney was genetically modified. It was to reduce risks of the human body rejecting it. For now, the patient is stable. The kidney is working. Does this mean animal organ transplants are the future? 
I ask because globally, organ demand is much higher than supply. Thousands wait every year for organs and many even die in the process. Animal organ transplants can solve this problem. But there are still many risks. Our next report explains. It was a four hour long surgery. The patient was Rick Slayman. He was diagnosed with end stage kidney disease. Slayman has been on the transplant list for 11 years. In 2018, he received a human kidney. It failed in about five years. So last year, doctors suggested an alternative, a pig kidney. Slayman weighed the pros and cons. He wasn't doing so well. So he decided to go with it. The surgery was performed on 16th March. It involved a 15-member team. Size with the pig kidneys was exactly the same as human kidneys. And despite um, difficult uh, patient, because um, advanced uh, vascular disease in this patient, the procedure went well. When we saw the first urine output, everyone in operating room burst in applause. It was truly the most beautiful kidney I have ever seen. It was a first ever pig to human kidney transplant. The organ came from a pig, but the kidney was later genetically modified. 69 precise edits were made to the pig's DNA. This was to make it compatible to the human body and reduces the chances of a human body rejecting it as foreign. And we chose uh, what's called the Yucatan mini pig. Uh, this is a pig that's Fully grown is about 150 pounds. Uh, and the reason we chose it is that fully grown, the organs are correctly sized to match with humans. Uh, in, in, the, in regards to Mr. Slayman's transplant, um, the, the organ uh, that was um, from the pig um, matched perfectly uh, the size of his organ. This is the third time a pig organ has transplanted into a human. The first two transplants were pig hearts, but they weren't very successful. Both patients died within weeks. So does this kidney have a better chance? Doctors believe it could. They think it can last for at least two years. We still don't know how many years uh, these kidneys can survive, but according, based on the, uh, our preclinical research, uh, we are aiming at years, uh, at least for two year, more than two years in the best case scenario, but still we have to be careful. Globally, the demand for organs far outstrips its supply. In the US, 27,000 kidneys were transplanted in 2023, but nearly 89,000 remain on the wait list. Every day, 17 people in the US die waiting for an organ. Kidneys are the most in demand. This brings us to xenotransplants, which transplants animal organs into humans. So xenotransplants could help solve the organ shortage but it has its own set of risks. There's the danger of transferring an unknown pathogen to the human body, or even triggering an immune response. But despite the risks and uncertainty, this transplant could be a major breakthrough, depending on how long this pig kidney works. Something unprecedented has happened in India. A sitting chief minister has been arrested. You're talking about Arvind Kejriwal. He heads the government in Delhi. He also leads the Aam Aadmi Party. It's one of the six national parties recognized by the Election Commission of India. So he's an important political player. And as expected, there is backlash. We've seen massive protests, a legal showdown, and a lot of accusations flying around. Tonight, we're looking at five questions linked to this story. Number one, why has Kejriwal been arrested? It was brewing for a while now. The Delhi government is accused of corruption in a liquor case. It's being investigated by multiple agencies. One of them is the ED, the Enforcement Directorate. This month, they named Kejriwal as a conspirator. So they asked him to appear for questioning, but he refused to go. He skipped nine summons by the ED. So last night, an ED team turned up at his house. At around 9 p.m. local time, he was taken into custody. Arvind Kejriwal spent the night in a small cell inside the ED head office. He will remain in ED custody until March 28th. That's six days. Question number two. What is the liquor scam? In most Indian states, government 
governments run liquor shops. It's a big money spinner for them. But Delhi tried to change that. Kejriwal's government in Delhi introduced a new liquor policy in 2021. It allowed private players to open liquor stores. At the same time, government shops were shut. The idea here was twofold. A, to improve customer experience and B, to generate more revenue. At first, it seemed to work. Delhi reported a 27% rise in revenue from liquor, but soon there was trouble. Delhi's top bureaucrat flagged issues with this policy. He said the government was running losses. How much? Almost 580 crore rupees, which is $69 million. He also said that Delhi ministers were getting kickbacks. So basically, they were taking money in exchange for liquor licenses. That was the charge. And that's where the case started. First, the CBI opened a probe. That's the Central Bureau of Investigation. They started the probe. And then the ED, the Enforcement Directorate. Which brings us to question number three. Is Arvind Kejriwal the only one behind bars in this case? He isn't. Delhi's former Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia is also in jail. So is Satyendra Jain, another former minister. Sanjay Singh, a party lawmaker. And K. Kavita, a politician from Telangana. She's the daughter of a former Chief Minister. So some big names have already been arrested. Now to question number four. What will Kejriwal do next? Yesterday night, his party approached the Supreme Court of India. They wanted to quash his arrest. But today, that request was withdrawn. So Kejriwal will be, was presented before a Delhi court. The ED wanted his custody for 10 days. They said he was the kingpin of this liquor case. His lawyers rejected this. They said there was no evidence to keep him in jail. The court gave its verdict just a short while ago. Arvind Kejriwal will remain in ED custody for six days, which raises a con constitutional question. His party says Kejriwal will remain chief minister. But how will he govern from jail? In the past, chief ministers have resigned before their arrest, like Jay Lalitha in Tamil Nadu and Lalu Yadav in Bihar. But Kejriwal has not stepped down. So what does the law say about the situation? Unless he is convicted, there is no obligation to resign. But governing from jail poses logistical challenges. A chief minister has dozens of meetings every day. But an inmate is allowed only two meetings per week. So how do you navigate that? Plus, the union government is seeking legal advice on the matter. Some experts say the center could suspend or dismiss him. And do not forget the question of ethics. Conviction or not, should a jail chief minister continue to govern? It's likely to raise many concerns. Finally, we have question number five. How will this affect the upcoming election in India? In many ways. This arrest has galvanized the Aam Aadmi Party. They're planning a massive protest over the weekend. It has also brought some unity in the opposition. Most parties have sided with Kejriwal. They say the government is weaponizing central agencies, basically using the ED to target leaders. At the same time, there will be criticism too. The Aam Aadmi Party emerged from an anti-corruption movement. Arvind Kejriwal was elected on a no-graft promise. But today, he's been arrested on the same charge, corruption. So many voters will say, there is no smoke without fire. Now, we don't know how this case will play out. But it will definitely raise the temperatures ahead of voting in India. Now let's turn our attention to South America, to Venezuela, where President Nicolas Maduro is at it again. Venezuela is set to go to polls soon. Maduro has a tough fight on his hands. So what does he do? Stir up trouble with the neighbor. Venezuela has a territorial dispute with neighboring Guyana. It's a small country of less than a million people and an area of about 215,000 square kilometers. But Venezuela claims over two-thirds of Guyana. It claims an oil-rich region called Essequibo. This dispute has existed for almost 200 years and yet it is now on the eve of elections that Venezuela has formally declared Essequibo a state escalating tensions when it should be preparing for elections. Here's our report. It's been approved unanimously. Consequently, the organic law for the defense of Guyana Esquiba is declared approved. And with that, Venezuela kicked up a hornet's nest. It has once again angered its neighbor, Guyana. 
Caracas has declared that two-thirds of the neighboring country is a new Venezuelan state. The region is called Essequibo. It has been the object of a two-century-long dispute, and now Venezuela has unilaterally tried to change the status quo. To add to the insult, Venezuela has named the state Guyana Essequiba. Imagine someone stealing your land and then naming it after you. Venezuela seems to be itching for a fight. Now technically, Venezuela has not taken over the land. Not yet, anyway. Essequibo is still administered by Guyana. Caracas hasn't sent in the army to annex the territory. But by declaring it a state and saying that they have a right to defend it, Venezuela has escalated tensions. And it has raised the specter of conflict. So why is Venezuela doing this? Why does it claim the land? And is the claim legitimate? These are tricky questions, because the dispute is older than the countries of Venezuela and Guyana. It stretches back to the 1800s, when both nations were European colonies. Venezuela was a Spanish colony. Guyana was first a Dutch territory, then the British took over. That's when the problem began. Britain were mapping the new acquisition, they walked into Spanish territory and thought it belonged to them. They drew up new maps and Essequibo was considered a part of British Guyana. Basically, a mapping error has led to a centuries-long dispute, which is British colonialism in a nutshell. However it happened, Guyana has governed Essequibo for almost 200 years. The region makes up two-thirds of Guyana. So, does Venezuela have the right to take over? Should Guyana be punished for the crimes of the British? These are questions the world has been struggling with. The US played mediator back in 1899. The United Nations had their say in 1966. And in 2018, the International Court of Justice was dragged in. But Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro doesn't want outside interference. He held a dubious referendum in December and then claimed that Venezuelans wanted him to reclaim the territory. He has been sending troops to the border and expanding military bases. Now, Venezuela's parliament has formally declared Essequibo a state. Why is Maduro escalating tensions? Well, one thing to note is that Essequibo is full of oil. Guyana has also seen a boom in oil production, with the influx of firms like American giant ExxonMobil. For the last three months, Guyana has exported more oil than Venezuela. And Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. Their exports have slumped because of US sanctions on Maduro. And likely competition from Guyana. So, is this a move to take out the competition? Or is it a distraction? Venezuela goes to polls in July. Reports say Maduro is losing support. So, is Essequibo a way for Maduro to unite Venezuelans behind him? There are many questions, and no one seems to have the answers. But one thing is clear, the world cannot afford another war. Ancient Greek philosophers had a strange conundrum they just couldn't figure out. They called it acharasia. Acharasia means acting against one's own best interest, basically doing what we know is bad for us. Now, to put this in, in the modern context, ordering takeout as groceries wilt, or doom scrolling even when your eyes hurt. Some thinkers say we fail to accept problems, therefore we fail to act on them. But acharasia is not just limited to humans, it is a modus operandi for many governments too. Let me give you an example. Today is World Water Day, so let's focus on water. You know that the world population is increasing, so is the demand for food. And to keep up with this demand, we must grow more crops, at least 50% more by 2050. That is, if nothing else changes, if the heat does not impact crops, if the soil does not degrade, if we do not lose more biodiversity, all of this will most likely happen. But let's say nothing changes. Even then, one thing could prevent humans from putting food on the table, and that is water. To meet the growing agricultural demands, we need more water. By 2050, irrigation needs to increase by 146%. That's what studies say, 146%. But there is a small problem here. Water has already maxed out. 
and this should be a wake-up call. Countries should be scrambling to save water. Yet it is business as usual. Agriculture still accounts for 90% of the world's fresh water use. We have pumped out so much water, we have changed the earth's spin. Now dry parts of the world are getting drier. Flash droughts are the new normal. Rivers are failing to reach the sea. Ice is melting rapidly. Freshwater species are becoming extinct at five times the rate of species that live on land, mind you. So many problems and one clear reason. Demand for water is outstripping supply. Let me show you a map. At least 25 countries face an extreme water crisis. India is part of the list. But the worst hit are Bahrain, Cyprus, Kuwait, Lebanon and Oman. These 25 countries are home to a quarter of the world's population, which means one-fourth of the world does not have proper access to drinking water. And there are many reasons why. For some, it is the over-reliance on groundwater, sometimes for household use, sometimes for infrastructure development. In other countries, agriculture is the biggest reason, and in some, climate change is a major culprit. But usually, it is a combination of factors. Countries know this. They have the data. They know how water scarcity is hurting them. The lack of water does not just create food insecurity, it also creates health problems. Because sanitation needs are not met. Half the world already lacks basic sanitation. On top of this, economic development takes a hit. Global trade suffers. Water scarcity also drives mass migration. It can spark conflict. So countries are under immense pressure. They need to, to innovate. They need better regulation, political and economic measures. But so far, only few of them have managed to succeed. Thailand is a success story. It has laws to control groundwater licensing and utilization. California has improved its water regulation as well. It has created locally tailored <coughs> conservation rules. Just about a decade ago, Israel had chronic water shortage. Today, it produces 20% more water than it needs because it manages to recycle more than 80% of its waste water. All these regions have different strategies. The only commonality is this. They came up with creative solutions. But that can only happen if nations first accept that they are in deep water. This week, Elon Musk made the news again, this time about his drug use. He shared details about his ketamine use. Ketamine is a drug primarily used in hospitals as an anesthetic. But Musk uses it for depression, and he's not the only one. From Wall Street giants to tech executives, a lot of them are said to be using substances to boost productivity and survive high-pressure jobs. It's called biohacking, or a means to enhance the body's functions. But what risks does it pose? Here's a report. Wall Street with a drug problem. Elon Musk microdosing on ketamine. High-powered women taking mushrooms. Tech executives using psychedelics. Traders and pilots using nicotine patches. We're not making this up. These are headlines from the past few months. Apparently, this is the new normal. Want to survive a high-pressure job? Just do drugs. A far cry from just say no. Clearly, that's a relic from the past, which is concerning, because we know the risks that drugs pose. Addiction, overdose, health problems. Plus, if drugs are bought on the street, they could be contaminated. That's even more dangerous. Even so, many professionals are using illicit substances. Why? To battle their long working hours. Many say they don't have the time to unwind or to connect with their friends. They need a quick fix, a pick-me-up. Others say drugs help them work better, keep up with their fast-paced jobs and increase creativity. Many people get pushed into drug use through their network, but others are inspired. Take the billionaire Tesla CEO for example. In a recent interview, Elon Musk discussed his use of medication ketamine. Ketamine is a drug. It's primarily used in hospitals as an anesthetic. But now, it's increasingly being used as a potential treatment for depression, anxiety and other mental health conditions. Musk said, There are times when I have a negative chemical state in my brain, like depression I guess, and ketamine is helpful for getting one out of the negative frame of mind. He's one of the world's most powerful people. He can influence millions. Now, Musk did add that he has a prescription for the drug and that he takes a small amount once every other week. But that kind of information is easier to slip through the cracks. And the result is not always positive. 
there is a dark side here. We saw this recently with the death of actor Matthew Perry. He died of an accidental ketamine overdose. Even so, drugs have become the new work-life trend. And the narrative has been built in a way that they have seamlessly fit into the definition of biohacking. Biohacking as a term gained popularity over the past decade. It refers to enhancing the body's ability to function. Some say it can even increase one's lifespan. Biohacking takes tips from multiple fields like biology, genetics, neuroscience and nutrition, all to enhance performance, be it physical or mental. Biohacking can happen with dietary shifts or supplements by using hyperbaric chambers or electromagnetic stimulators. Now, biohacking based on thorough research can be safe. But with millions of articles and TikToks on it, it's difficult to know what's credible. And that risk only increases with drugs. But even if they were safe, there's another problem here. That of pushing one's body to the breaking point instead of taking a break. So at the end of the day, taking drugs to enhance performance is not biohacking. It's just a hack job at the altar of workaholism. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Ukraine, a Russian missile hits the country's largest dam in southern Japarizia. In Bolivia, 60 Paddington bears were found, raising hope for conservation efforts. And scientists are rushing to regrow Thailand's dying coastal coral reefs. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1945, the Arab League was formed. It's a regional organization of Arab states. Initially, seven Arab nations formed the League. It was to foster economic growth in West Asia. Later, 15 more joined the League. We're leaving on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. The world order is heading towards a major shake-up. Alliances are being formed and years of Western dominance is slowly fading away. Europe is too busy trying to keep Putin's war machine at bay. And amid all the chaos, the global south is emerging. Asia is turning into the focal point of power. India has become a dependable diplomatic and military partner. And in a rare show of strength, New Delhi has begun showing its teeth. For the last two years, India's security concerns have been about China. But that doesn't mean New Delhi has forgotten its age-old problem. The noisy Western neighbour, Pakistan. The only army in the world which has its very own nation. India and Pakistan have fought four wars against each other, and the border skirmishes are countless. They both have nuclear weapons, which is why they never turn a blind eye towards the other. As Pakistan waited for its 
selected government to take charge in February, New Delhi prepared for any threat from Islamabad or Rawalpindi. For the first time ever, India hosted the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia in back-to-back -back military exercises. And the drills were held very strategically. The Indian Army hosted the West Asian nations in the sand dunes of Rajasthan. Rajasthan shares a long border and has seen its fair share of war with Pakistan. The drills were held in a small town called Mahajan, just 200 kilometers away from Pakistan. The goal was simple increase bonhomie between the soldiers and familiarize them with their new friends. The drills with the UAE were called Desert Cyclone. 45 troops from both the armies participated. The UAE brought in the Zayed 1st Brigade. India was represented by the Mechanized Infantry Regiment. Troops worked together on cordon and search operations, domination tactics and heliborne missions. The Saudi troops were also hosted in Rajasthan marking the first time that the Royal Kingdom's troops trained on Indian soil. 45 troops from each side took part. The kingdom was represented by the Royal Saudi Land Forces. India sent in its Brigade of Guards. The soldiers took part in house intervention drills, slithering and live firing, followed by cordon and search operations. There was a time when Pakistan would train Emirati and Saudi troops, but now India has emerged as the trusted partner. It wasn't just the UAE and Saudi Arabia that got the opportunity to hold drills on Pakistan's doorstep. India's most trusted friend, Japan, also tasted the action. Japan's self-defense forces made their way through the sand dunes of Rajasthan. This exercise's aim or is a platoon-level exercise, in which two platoons, two countries, one of the platoons, meet in semi-desert operations or semi-urban terrain. In which way they are operating? On that basis, this training is based on that. 40 troops from each side practiced desert warfare. They conducted search and destroy drills, heliborne operations and live fire displays. The troops also performed yoga and learned about each other's battalions. Inviting the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Japan for military drills just a few hundred kilometers away from Pakistan shows just how much New Delhi trusts its allies. As the Indian Army was busy making friends in Mahajan, India's fighter jets were getting loaded up with heavy-grade bombs. The Indian Air Force launched Vayu Shakti 2024, its largest exercise ever. Like the Army drills, these too were in Rajasthan, in the sand dunes of Pokhran, a few hundred kilometers south of Mahajan where the Army was in combat mode. It was a clear message to the forces across the border. New Delhi was in no mood for any foul play. Air Force Station Jodhpur is one of the biggest uh, air bases of the Indian Air Force and uh, is one of the primary air bases uh, for launching uh, a plethora of aircraft towards exercise uh, Vai Shakti 24. The aircraft which are likely to operate uh, from here are the versatile uh, Su-30 MK and our newest induction, the Rafale aircraft. A uh, number of weapons will be fired by these aircraft. Uh, some of the weapons which will be fired by Rafale uh, constitute of uh, air-to-air -air missiles. And Su-30 MK will be carrying out uh, carpet bombing, where uh, they will be using a uh, number of 1,000-pounders. Uh, From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issue. But above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Hello and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Am coming to you live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. 
We'll get you a roundup of all the day's top stories, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. Russian airstrikes cause a blackout in seven Ukrainian regions. Kiev accuses Moscow of deliberately targeting the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Australia signs a deal worth $3 billion to jointly produce nuclear-powered submarines with the UK as part of the Trilateral Security Alliance AUKUS with the United States. In India, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal appears in court a day after his arrest in a liquor policy case. The accused leader calls it a political vendetta. More than 70 Rohingya refugees reported missing after a boat capsizes off the coast of Indonesia. If confirmed, this would be the biggest catastrophe involving asylum seekers this year. An unidentified attacker's ambush and kill 23 soldiers of the Niger army while wounding another 17. Niger's army says at least 100 gunmen came on motorcycles wearing suicide bombs. We begin with updates on the Israel-Hamas war as efforts to reach a truce continue. The United Nations Security Council is expected to vote on a U.S. resolution calling for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza for six weeks and the release of hostages. Now it's important to note the use of the word immediate in the draft resolution as Washington has refrained from using it while calling for a ceasefire. Now, the previous U.S. resolution, which was moved at the U.N. Security Council in February, called for a temporary ceasefire as soon as practical. Now, since the war began, the U.S. has vetoed three draft resolutions, two of which demanded an immediate ceasefire. In fact, just last month, Washington vetoed an Arab resolution that called for an immediate ceasefire. Now, Washington had such an action Washington had said such an action could jeopardize talks and would interfere with negotiations surrounding the hostages. Earlier, the U.S. also was averse to the word ceasefire and vetoed measures that called for an immediate ceasefire. But the latest U.S. resolution marks a further toughening of Washington's stance towards Israel. In fact, the language backs talks brokered by Egypt and Qatar over a ceasefire. Now, in order for a resolution to pass in the Security Council, it will need at least nine votes in favor and no veto by the permanent members of the Council. Those members include the United States, France, Britain, Russia, and China. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who's in Israel today, said he believes talks in Qatar could still reach an agreement. The need for an immediate, sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. Uh, that would create space to surge more humanitarian assistance to relieve uh, the suffering of many people and to build something more enduring. Uh, we've been working, as you know, with Egypt, with Qatar, uh, and with Israel to put a strong proposal on the table. Um, Hamas uh, responded to that. Uh, the negotiators continue to work. Uh, the gaps are narrowing. Uh, and we're continuing to push for an agreement in Doha. Uh, there's still difficult work to get there, but I continue to believe uh, it's possible. Now the CIA and Mossad chiefs will be arriving in Qatar today to join the talks. And the main sticking point has been that Hamas says that it will release hostages only as part of a deal that would end the war, while Israel says it will discuss only a temporary pause. The Netanyahu government has continued to vow to eliminate Hamas. Now, the latest U.S. resolution also increases pressure on Israel to allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza, where severe hunger is worsening and the United Nations warns of an imminent famine. The European leaders, European Union leaders also called for a humanitarian pause in Gaza as well. And they also called for the unconditional release of all hostages and urged Israel to not proceed 
with a ground offensive in Rafa. What's happening today in Gaza is the failure of humanity. It's not a humanitarian crisis. It's the failure of humanity. It's not a earthquake. It's not a flood. It's bombing. The only way of stopping this humanitarian crisis, human crisis, is Israel respecting more civilians and allowing more support to enter into Gaza. The consensus of tonight is that we need an immediate humanitarian pause leading to a sustained ceasefire, the unconditional release of hostages, and the provision of humanitarian assistance. Gaza is on the verge of famine a catastrophic humanitarian situation. Full, rapid, safe and unhindered humanitarian access into Gaza via all routes is essential. Now, after European leaders huddled in Brussels, the focus today shifts to New York. Will the United Nations Security Council pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire after five months of war, or will the U.S. resolution be vetoed? Many questions, very, very few answers. And in the Red Sea, Yemen-based Houthis have struck another commercial ship in the Gulf of Aden. The rebel group claims an American flagged vessel was critically hit with a number of missiles. The Houthis also claim to have fired long-range missiles towards Israel. The naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out a targeting operation against the American ship Mado in the Red Sea with a number of appropriate missiles. The missile forces also fired a number of winged missiles at Israeli targets in the occupied Palestine, successfully hitting the targets, thanks to God. Now, U.S. officials did confirm that a commercial vessel was in fact struck but did not sustain any major damage. The Iran-backed group had issued another round of threats against American, British and Israeli ships passing through the Red Sea. Now this comes as reports emerge of the Houthis striking a deal with Russia and China for safe passage of their commercial ships. Meanwhile, Washington continues to strengthen its forces in the region. The aircraft carrier USS Dwight D. Eisenhower has been in the thick of all the action. The carrier group's captain says that his fleet has been attacked by the Houthis every single day for the last four months. The captain goes on to say that the biggest threat is from anti-ship missiles and long-range kamikaze drones. He states the U.S. Navy has not deployed its aircraft carriers at this scale since World War II. The Houthis are the biggest threat we've seen, end quote. The U.S. Navy launches airborne operations almost every minute against the Houthis, and American naval aviators and their crews are beginning to feel the effects, calling it the most flying that they've ever done on a deployment. Meanwhile, maintenance crews have raised red flags as the intensity of operations continues to grow. The aircraft carrier's deck is performing a launch or recovery every minute, and it's taking a toll on the ship as well as the fighter jets. Still, the Houthis continue to arm themselves with low-cost, long-range weapons, and fighters of the rebel group are even storing rocket launchers, anti-ship missiles, and long-range drones in their homes. We have locally made rifles, pistols, rockets, and various types of sniper rifles, as well as RPGs and shells. All categories of heavy and light weapons are now available. All of this is in preparation for the upcoming phase with the Great Satan, the American and British and their proxies. Now, despite the large presence of Western militaries, the threat from the Houthis remains alarming. Even with the deployment of America's powerful carrier strike group, the waters of the Red Sea remain extremely dangerous. And now to the violence in the Caribbean. Haiti's police has launched a counteroffensive, killing at least two gang leaders in a span of 24 hours. During the operation, a gang leader named Ernst Jume was killed in Port-au-Prince. Now, Jume was the leader of a faction called Delmas 95 and a close aide of the man who started the entire chaos, Jimmy Chirizier. Now, Jume's death is a major setback for Chirizier and his gangs, as Jume joined Chirizier's war only recently 
after a jailbreak. Jume had been tasked with the takeover of posh neighborhoods in Haiti's capital. Now Shadizier has vowed to avenge the death of his trusted aide. The former cop turned gang leader has threatened to increase the intensity of violence. Meanwhile, the international community has stalled its promised intervention in Haiti. And moreover, the transition council that was meant to take over after the prime minister Ariel Henry's resignation is facing a roadblock. The nine member council had been finalized by the, neighbor, the neighboring Caribbean nations and the United States. But now there are reports of a political divide in the Caribbean community as they fail to agree on a new leader for Haiti. However, Washington has said that the formation of the Transition Council is nearing completion. I understand that Haitian stakeholders are very close to finalizing membership and remain in active discussions with CARICOM leaders as it, make, as it, as it relates to the makeup of the Transitional Presidential Council. However, Shadizia's gang says that they will not allow the Transition Council to govern Haiti. We don't recognize the CARICOM meetings. We don't recognize the UN Security Council meetings. We don't recognize the body group meetings. We don't recognize the meetings held at the White House. Haiti's destiny has already been made and is not part of any of these groups. Now, as the fighting escalates, nations, including France and Germany, have begun rescuing their citizens from Haiti. India, too, has launched an operation with support from the Dominican Republic. Meanwhile, Washington continues to provide aid and relief for Haitians as calls for action grow in the United States. It's in our backyard, uh, and many of the residents of Haiti uh, are from New York City, from Miami, and from other parts of the Americas. And it's imperative that we have an immediate response. Uh, we cannot ignore it and act like it is not taking place. There are immediate things we can do right now. Stop the flow of guns, stop the deportation, give the expertise on how to stabilize the community and give the resources that are needed at this time. Now, with no sight of the transition council, should EZA and his gangs have the upper hand while the people of Haiti feel let down both by their government and the international community. And moving on from a turbulent nation to a troubled economy, Nigerian President Bola Tinubu has announced a ban on public funded foreign trips of his ministers and government officials. The decision comes amidst growing criticism over his government's travel expenses. Our next report explains the details. Nigerian officials will not be able to take public funded foreign trips anymore. And that's because President Bola Tinubu has announced a travel ban for ministers and government officials. The three-month ban will begin from the 1st of April. The Nigerian government will only allow tours that are deemed absolutely necessary. And even those trips would require President Tinubu's nod. His approval will be given at least two weeks before the travel date. The President's office says these travel restrictions will ensure that the government officials focus on their respective mandates for effective service delivery. Tinubu's chief of staff adds that the decision was prompted by concerns over rising travel expenses. The Nigerian administration has been facing criticism for its foreign visits. The president himself has made more than 15 foreign trips since his inauguration in May 2023. Reports suggest that the president spent over $2.2 million in the first six months of his tenure for domestic and foreign trips. The amount was reportedly 36% more than the total travel budget amount for 2023. And what infuriated Nigerians more was the Dubai COP summit last November. The Nigerian government sponsored as many as 400 people to attend the summit, a move that was widely criticized on social media. Tinubu woke up to the backlash and took some measures to bring down expenses. In January, the Nigerian president announced a reduction in the size of the official travel delegations. He ordered a 60% reduction in the size of delegations, including his own travel entourage. However, it remains unclear whether Tinubu himself will cut down his trips. 
Earlier, the president and his representatives defended his trips as vital in addressing the economic issues of Nigeria, a problem that Tinubu is often accused of ignoring. Nigerians are reeling under a severe cost of living crisis. The country's inflation rate rose to almost 30% in February, which is the highest in nearly three decades. The cost of food has also gone up by more than 35%. There are a lot of friends that I know that used to buy tomatoes and they can no longer buy them. They cannot sell it again. They are just trying to find what they can eat now and not to do the tomatoes business again. Even those that push trucks, now a lot of them cannot push it again because the tomatoes are very expensive. Like today it was the last food, that's what um, I made this, this morning. My son took it to school. I don't even have any in my pot now, I don't even have any to eat. I'm not even worried about that, I'm just thinking of what all you eat if he comes back. These economic hardships have spread public discontent across Nigeria. Though the Nigerian president has announced travel curbs to cut down expenses, the question arises. With severe economic crisis grappling the country, are these measures enough to deal with the situation? And finally, in Latin America, where the policies of the Maduro government are intensifying Venezuela's long-standing dispute with Guyana, the two neighbors have been in a conflict over the oil-rich region of Esquibo. The Maduro government has approved the creation of a new state in Esquibo, which is currently under the control of the Guyanese administration. Now, is this a fight for Venezuela's sovereignty or Maduro's attempt to bolster support ahead of the presidential election? Our next report seeks to provide answers. The long-standing dispute between Latin American neighbors Venezuela and Guyana is brewing into a storm. They've been at loggerheads over the oil-rich region of Essequibo. And now, this storm is further being fueled by Venezuela's domestic politics. Venezuelan lawmakers allied with President Nicolas Maduro have approved the creation of a new state in Essequibo, the disputed territory with Guyana. The Maduro government claims it has the right to govern Essequibo. Tensions peaked between the two sides last year. In December, both Venezuela and Guyana agreed to avoid any use of force after the leaders of the two nations met. However, satellite images from last month show Venezuela expanding military bases near its border with Guyana. The dispute is also pending at the International Court of Justice. The ICJ is to decide on which country the territory belongs to. But Venezuela has already ruled out accepting an ICJ decision. It says it doesn't recognize the International Court of Justice. Last year, Venezuela also held a referendum to claim sovereignty over Essequibo. The Maduro government said 95% of voters approved territorial claim on the territory and called it a big win. Guyana hit back, saying its borders are not up for discussion and that it will defend its sovereignty. We have taken the first steps of a new historical stage to fight for what is ours, to recover what the liberators left us, the Guyana Esquiba. The Venezuelan people have spoken loud and clear, and this victory belongs to all the people of Venezuela, without discrimination or partisanship. The measures announced are in blatant disregard of the order given by the International Court of Justice on December 1st, 2023. Guyana views this as an imminent threat to its territorial integrity and will intensify precautionary measures to safeguard its territory. The disputed territory Essequibo, which is currently governed by Guyana, is notable for two reasons. One, it is massive. The 160,000 square kilometer region is mostly thick jungle. It makes up roughly two thirds of the entire land area of Guyana. It's even larger than the size of England. Two, and more importantly, the land is rich in natural resources, primarily petroleum. This territorial dispute has roots in the colonial era. 
In the late 1800s, the US and the UK agreed to split the territory between modern-day Guyana and Venezuela. A majority of the Essequibo region was granted to the Guyanese administration. The conflict remained mostly dormant in the 21st century until 2013. That year, Guyana discovered abundant petroleum reserves in the territorial waters above Essequibo. The discovery of offshore oil and gas continued in the following years. Today, Guyana's petroleum reserves are similar to those of Kuwait. It even outranks Saudi Arabia, Norway and Qatar as the country with the world's second-highest oil reserves per capita. And access to even a part of these reserves could bring in respite for Venezuela's struggling economy. The Venezuelan economy has collapsed in the last decade despite having some of the largest oil deposits in the world. It has been battling spiraling inflation. There are domestic troubles too, including organized crime, gang violence and corruption. But President Nicolas Maduro has been amping up threats to annex the neighbor. Maduro has attempted to use the conflict with Guyana to bolster support at home. His saber-rattling has also intensified as polls in the Latin American country draw closer. Venezuela will go to polls in July this year to choose a president for a six-year term. So, is Nicolas Maduro using the decades-long dispute to divert attention from domestic issues ahead of elections? That's our show for today. We certainly thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you right back here again on Monday. Have a great weekend and thanks again for watching. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.